On this episode of Black Girl Gone, I tell the story of Tasha Lampkin, a 30-year-old woman who was murdered in Bossier City, Louisiana on April 23rd, 2005. The day before she was found, Tasha had traveled from Houston to Louisiana to visit family with her cousin. After arriving, they checked into a motel, and around 3.30 a.m., Tasha left to go get some food from a local restaurant. But she never returned to the motel. Two and a half hours after she was last seen, the car she was driving was found engulfed in flames on the side of a road 20 minutes from the motel. And inside the trunk, they found the badly burned body of Tasha Lampkin. Once the investigation began, it didn't take detectives long to find out who did this and the senseless reason why Tasha was murdered. This is Tasha's story. Statistically, people are murdered more often by people they know than a random stranger, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. The scary part is that anyone can be the victim of a violent crime, and women are particularly vulnerable and are often seen as easy targets. Tasha Lampkin sadly became one of those victims, and her story is a tragic tale of simply being at the wrong place at the wrong time, where she crossed paths with pure evil. Tasha Lampkin was born on January 23, 1975, and grew up in Houston, Texas. As a child, Tasha's family didn't have much, but she grew up surrounded by a loving extended family. They described Tasha as a creative young lady who developed a love for sewing, and so she taught herself how to use a sewing machine and began making her own clothes. Her cousin said that she would cut up different clothes and fabrics and transform them. When Tasha was in high school, she got pregnant and gave birth to a little boy. Although she was a young mom, her family said that her son was her whole world, and after he was born, she was determined to make sure that he had more in life than she had growing up. Tasha had always loved children, and so she decided that she wanted to open up a daycare. It was a way of doing something she loved while also providing for her son. Her cousin Tanya, who Tasha was very close with, joined her in running the daycare. It was a lot of work, but they both loved what they did. As a way to unwind from the stresses of being a mother and a business owner, Tasha and Tanya would often go to Shreveport, Louisiana, where they had family to visit and unwind. Shreveport is about a four-hour drive from Houston. And in April 2005, Tasha and Tanya decided to take one of these routine trips. Another cousin of Tasha's rented a car for them to drive from the local Hertz. She actually rented two cars, one for her and an Altima for Tasha and Tanya to take to Shreveport. On April 22nd, 2005, Tasha and Tanya left Houston in the rental car to drive to Shreveport. They arrived in Bossier City, which is about seven minutes outside Shreveport, around 11 p.m., and checked in to the David Motel. Tanya said that since it was too late to go to their family's house, they decided to check into the motel for the night. After settling into their room, the women got hungry, but there weren't many things open at that time except Waffle House. and so. They ordered some takeout. At around 3.30 a.m., Tasha left the motel to pick up the food, and Tanya decided to stay behind. After Tasha left, at some point, Tanya fell asleep. But Tasha never came back to the motel room. On April 23rd, 2005, around 8 a.m., Tanya woke up and realized that her cousin had never came back with the food. After discovering that Tasha had not come back, Tanya, worried, began calling around to family to see if anyone had seen Tasha, but no one had seen her or spoken to her. It was confusing because Tasha was just supposed to be picking up food from the nearby Waffle House, but five hours later, she was nowhere to be found. No one in Tasha's family, including her cousin Tanya, had any idea of the nightmare that was about to unfold. Two hours before Tanya woke up and discovered Tasha missing, Caddo Parish Fire Department got a call around 6 a.m. about a car fire on Coon Road. When firefighters arrived on the scene, they found the vehicle fully engulfed in flames. 
The firefighters put out the fire, but the flames were so hot that the trunk of the car had melted away. And when they looked in the trunk, they found a badly burned body lying on its right side with its head facing the driver's side. It was a horrific discovery. The body had been burned beyond recognition. The police couldn't tell the race or the sex of the victim. Once the body was discovered, the local police were called to the scene. And when the detectives arrived, they observed the gruesome scene inside the trunk. They had no idea what had happened, but they knew they were dealing with a murder and someone was trying to cover up evidence. The license plate was a critical piece of evidence in determining who was their victim since it was the only piece of evidence to survive the blaze. And so detectives ran the plates and discovered that the car had been rented from a Hertz in Houston, Texas. Detectives contacted Hertz and learned that the car had been rented by a woman named Renee. They were not sure if she was their victim, but they reached out to her to see if they could get any information about the vehicle and their victim. Detectives were able to get in contact with Renee, and so they knew then that she was not the person found in the trunk. However, she did inform them that she had rented two cars from Hertz, a Camry for herself and a Nissan Altima for her cousins, Tasha and Tanya, who had driven to Shreveport the night before. Renee told them that her cousins were staying at the David Motel in Bossier City. Now, by the time Renee was contacted by detectives, Tanya had already woken up and found Tasha gone, and one of the people that she had contacted looking for Tasha was Renee. Renee relayed that information to detectives, and so after speaking to her, they headed over to the David Motel to speak to Tanya. Tanya said that police knocked on the door that morning, and when she answered the door, they told her that her rental car had been found burning on the side of the road, and there was a body found inside the trunk. Tanya knew immediately that it was her cousin Tasha. Detectives asked Tanya if they could search the motel room, which she allowed. Inside the room, they collected Tasha's Texas ID, a toothbrush of hers, and a ticket that she had gotten on the drive from Houston to Shreveport. After speaking to Tanya, they learned that Tasha had left the room to get food from a local restaurant, but never returned. While at the David Motel, Detectives noticed that there were surveillance cameras outside, and so they asked the owners for copies of the tapes, which they willingly handed over. Now, before leaving the motel, detectives spoke to several people, but none of them had seen or heard anything unusual earlier that morning. After visiting the motel, next, detectives went to the Waffle House where Tasha was supposed to be picking up food. At the restaurant, they spoke to a woman who gave them a receipt showing that Tasha had picked up the food between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on the morning of the 23rd. It confirmed that Tasha had made it to the Waffle House and that something had happened to her after she left. At that point, detectives were pretty sure the victim in the car was Tasha Lampkin, but they needed to confirm this for sure. Back at the crime scene, the body was badly burned and it was impossible to get fingerprints, and so they would need DNA testing to confirm the ID. The investigators working the scene found several spent shell casings, and there were two bullet holes near the gas tank. After the car was moved to the storage facility for further examination and testing, investigators found the key to the trunk, which had been left in the lock when the car was set on fire. They also found several gold teeth, one of which had the letter T engraved on it, along with some bobby pins. Now, due to the condition of the body, it was going to take several weeks before identity could be confirmed, but detectives were convinced that they had found Tasha Lampkin. Now, they needed to piece together what happened to her after she left the Waffle House that morning. Armed with the surveillance footage from the motel, the detectives went back to their office and began reviewing footage. The first thing detectives noticed was that the footage was off by an hour, but since they had a basic timeline of when Tasha left the motel and when she arrived at Waffle House, they were able to locate the footage they needed. The surveillance footage captured the champagne-colored Nissan Altima leaving the motel parking lot at around 3.30 a.m. A short time later, at around 3.56 a.m., the car is seen returning to the lot. 
But this time, there was another small red car following behind. Detectives determined that it was a Toyota Tercel. Now, the Altima pulls into the space, and the other car parks directly behind it. Both cars sit there for about a minute before pulling off out of the camera's sight. The footage was grainy, and so detectives were unable to make out the license plate on the vehicle. All they knew was the make and model and color. But that wasn't going to be enough. The detectives working the case were not sure if this car had anything to do with the murder, but they wanted to speak to the driver. Perhaps the car belonged to a friend or a family member of Tasha's. Maybe she was going somewhere voluntarily and then something happened along the way. There was no way to know for sure how this car was connected, but detectives knew that it was the first piece of critical evidence they had, and they needed to figure out if or how it was involved. They suspected at this point that Tasha had either been forced or coerced into leaving that parking lot. After hours of combing through the footage to see if they could find anything else, detectives turned to the media for help. Footage and images from the surveillance cameras were released to the local news with pleas for information about the Toyota Tercel. Because the car had unique characteristics, according to police, they believed that someone would be able to identify the car and lead them to who was driving it that night. While investigators waited for tips about the car, they continued their investigation. Now, they still had not confirmed the identity of the victim, and although they were more than positive it was Tasha, they began speaking to people close to her to see if she was involved in anything that would lead to something like this. But Tasha was not involved in anything nefarious. She was a mom, a business owner, and she was in the area visiting family like she had done dozens of times before. And although she didn't live in Shreveport, it wasn't a strange place for her or Tanya. Detectives working the case could not find a reason why anyone would want to hurt Tasha. She had only been in town for a few hours before something terrible happened to her. And it was terrifying to those who knew her and the community at large. But... As detectives begin to peel back the layers in this case, they start to uncover the shocking truth behind what really happened to Tasha. In the early morning hours of April 23, 2005, 30-year-old Tasha Lampkin left her motel in Bossier City, Louisiana to grab some food from a local Waffle House. Two and a half hours later, the car she was driving was found burning on the side of a road, and a body was found in the trunk. Even though ID had not been confirmed, detectives were sure that they had found Tasha. Now, they needed to find out what happened to her. In the days following the discovery of a badly burned body in the trunk of a car, last seen driven by Tasha Lampkin, detectives working the case were trying to figure out what happened after she left the Waffle House. After speaking to her cousin Tanya, who had traveled with her to Louisiana, they learned that there was a man that Tasha would see when she came to Shreveport. Tanya gave detectives his name, and they contacted him, and he agreed to be interviewed. He told detectives that he and Tasha were friends, but he was living a kind of double life because he had a girlfriend who he lived with and had a child with, but he had not told Tasha anything about that relationship. He told police that he was home with his girlfriend when Tasha was murdered, and detectives were able to corroborate his alibi, and so he was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. After ruling him out, investigators turned their attention back to that surveillance footage. They needed to find out who was driving that Toyota Tercel that night. After turning to the media to get the public's help, Detectives waited to see if anyone would come forward, and they got a huge break when a woman contacted police to tell them that she recognized the car and believed it belonged to her daughter, Laquetta. And she told them her daughter's car had similar damage and characteristics to the one shown in the footage. After speaking to the mother, detectives made contact with Laquetta. And she told detectives that on the night of April 22nd, 
she had allowed a man named Dwight Bacon to use her car. She said Dwight asked to borrow her car to go see his girlfriend, something he had never done before, but for whatever reason, she allowed him to borrow it, and he told her that he would put gas in it. Laquetta said that Dwight left around 9.30 p.m., but she didn't hear from him again until the next morning. She said when she called him on the cell phone that she had let him borrow, he told her that he was on the way and then hung up. Once he got back, she could hear him outside talking to another man, but she couldn't make out what he was saying. Learning about Dwight driving the car captured on the surveillance footage that night was a huge break for this investigation. After speaking to Laquetta, detectives tracked down Dwight Bacon after she told them where he lived. When detectives knocked on the door of the apartment, they were met by a black male who identified himself as Dwight Bacon. Detectives asked him to come with them to the station so he could be interviewed, and he agreed. At first, Dwight denied having any involvement with Tasha's murder. He told them that he did not know her, and on that night, he had been alone. Detectives, however, did not believe Dwight. They knew that he was involved and that someone else was with him. Detectives continued to press him, and eventually, Dwight began to tell detectives more and began to admit his involvement in Tasha's murder. He also gave them the name of another man who he said was his accomplice, a man named Brandon Davis. After learning about Brandon, detectives were able to track him down, and he also agreed to come into the station to be interviewed. During the first of what would be three interviews, Brandon initially denied involvement in Tasha's murder, he admitted that he had been in the Toyota with Dwight, but he claimed it wasn't that day. The problem with that admission was that the 22nd was the one and only night that Dwight Bacon had driven that car. Eventually, after several hours of intense interviews, Brandon Davis began to admit his role in this murder also. He admitted that he had held Dwight's gun that night, but that he had no idea that Dwight was going to kill someone and that that was not his intention. He said that he had gone out to rob and carjack people. He told detectives that while Dwight was raping and murdering Tasha, he was just standing there watching in disbelief. He said then they drove to the location where the car was found, and Tasha was told to get in the trunk. After that, they lit a box on fire that was placed on the back seat, and they used grass and weeds to fuel the fire. He told them that Tasha was still alive when the fire was set. After his confession, both Brandon Davis and Dwight Bacon were charged with first-degree murder. After his arrest, Dwight Bacon's apartment was searched, and inside, investigators found a .380 caliber handgun and a box of bullets that matched the ones found at the scene. They also discovered that the gun was bought the day of the murder from a local pawn shop. Now, while Bacon and Davis sat in jail awaiting trial, after months of testing, the DNA results finally came back, confirming what detectives already knew. The body they found in the trunk was Tasha Lampkin. But they also learned how brutal her death was. The results from the autopsy confirmed Tasha was alive when that car was set on fire. She had soot in her lungs and carbon monoxide in her liver. After a short investigation, detectives had solved the abduction and brutal murder of Tasha Lampkin. She had gone to pick up food when she was spotted at the Waffle House by Bacon and Davis. They followed her back to her hotel where they pulled up behind her. One of the men got out of the vehicle and at gunpoint forced her to drive to another location where she was raped by both men. She was then driven to the location where the car was found where she was raped again before being forced in the trunk of that car. While in jail, Davis admitted to another inmate that they had killed Tasha to get rid of evidence. He told him that they were afraid Tasha had seen the license plate from the Toyota. And even though she begged for her life, telling them that she was a mother and promising to not tell anyone, her pleas fell on deaf ears. They brutally murdered this woman, and all they walked away with was about $80. 
That's how much her life was worth to them. In August 2008, Brandon Davis was the first to go on trial for Tasha's murder. Brandon tried to distance himself from the crime and placed the murder solely on Dwight Bacon. Davis's defense was that he was there, but that he had not raped or killed Tasha. However, the state star witness ended up being a man that Davis was locked up with for eight months, beginning in April 2005, after his arrest. He testified at trial that Brandon confessed to him his involvement in the murder on several occasions. The two men had developed a friendship, and Davis, who was just 21 at the time of his arrest, felt comfortable confiding in him. He recalled for the jury the disgusting details of the crime that took place that night and the unspeakable things that were done to Tasha during the last couple of hours of her life. He then read from a letter written by Davis to him. Quote, I'm going to tell you something because I know you probably got a feeling about me. First, I'm not a hardcore gangster. As we follow that person, I know in my mind that that person did not have nothing worth committing a crime over. The stuff we got was nowhere near. Nowhere near the money. It wasn't even close to 100, maybe 80. And when you were steady asking me questions, I was tripping. What did we do with the money? Hell, my friend, it wasn't shit to do with anything. Like you thought, I was just trying to show a MF I was still wild and went along with the dumb stuff. And I deserved to get punished. Even though I have a lot of good in me, I'm completely embarrassed of telling you my crimes. That's why I trip out on you. I'm not telling you this just to tell somebody. I just want to be completely truthful to somebody. I'm just a young MF that's went through a little hard time and made a lot of bad decisions. I never really sold drugs, but what embarrasses me the most, I've took somebody away from life and now I'm charged with that kind of crime. Maybe all my dirt has caught up to me. Thug, I'm not trying to impress you. This is me. I haven't done shit to impress nobody. And I'm beginning to feel a lot better giving you the absolute truth because I know sooner or later you're going to be gone and I feel like we're using each other to pass time, but my feelings are kind of serious. Man, I'm just a petty robber and then stuck his feet in some shit. So now you know what the deal is. Ain't no sense of fronting. The trial lasted three days. And on April 25th, 2008, Brandon Davis was found guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Dwight Bacon was set to stand trial next, but he instead pled guilty to avoid the death penalty and was also sentenced to life in prison. Both men are currently serving their sentences in a Louisiana state prison. It did not take long for detectives to find the monsters who took Tasha's life. But her senseless murder is a reminder of how evil people can be. How could you murder someone over $80? She was a mother, and she left her son to visit family, never knowing that she would never come back home. A trip that she had taken many times before turned out to be her last. After her murder, Tasha's mom took custody of her son, and at a very young age, his whole world was turned upside down. The only comfort is that these two men are off the streets and were caught before they could murder anyone else and that they will spend the rest of their lives in prison. Tasha Lampkin did not deserve what happened to her. No one deserves to be burned alive inside of a car. But she was more than just a body in a trunk. She was a mom a daughter, a cousin, and a friend, and she deserved more. May Tasha Lampkin rest in peace. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Threads.